Good morning. How are y'all doing this morning? Did everybody get in? Did you have to swim in or ride a canoe or something to get in today? It's been a, kind of a nasty day. Uh, appreciate y'all all coming out and listening to our ag forecast. We'd like to welcome you to, I guess we've been doing this for 10 or 12 years now. So it keeps getting bigger every year from support from people like y'all. So we appreciate you taking the time to come out and listen to what we have to say. Uh, before we get started, everybody should have some books on your table. One's going to be the ag forecast book. We're going to go over a lot of information today and there's information in that book that may or may not be covered today. So make sure you take a look at that. If you do have some questions, we'll have a question and answer period here, but uh, also to the authors in there, their contact information is in that book. So if you need additional information, have additional questions, please feel free to contact them. And then also you'll have a little green book is what is the Ag Snapshot book. And it kind of gives a quick overview of what's going on in Georgia in terms of agriculture. We break it down by some of the major commodity groups. And it just gives you an idea of how big or how much uh, economic activity is generated through agriculture in the state by commodity and also employment. And then if you look in the back, you can find the different counties listed and see how much uh, economic contribution ag provides to each of the counties. And it's kind of neat if you look at Fulton and Gwinnett and some of the more urban counties, there's actually a lot of ag and related businesses in there. And I think a lot of time people don't realize that. So. I'd like to welcome y'all here today, and I think we're going to have uh, Amanda Tetro come up and give us the welcome from, from the Clark County Extension Service. Right. Thanks, Kent. Um, I do want to welcome everyone to Athens um, on this rainy morning. So while Athens doesn't have as much um, of the traditional agriculture uh, that most of the other state has, we do have a lot of urban agriculture and we work with quite a few of the um, small farmers. Uh, many of them um, have a more organic focus. But the nice thing is here in, in Athens, uh, we are surrounded by five of the top 10 ag counties in the state. Um, so we do recognize um, how important agriculture is here. I did want to let you know that this Saturday, um, UGA Extension, uh, many of our departments, um, as well as Extension in Clark, Oconee, and Madison counties, we are partnering with the Athens Land Trust. We have a sustainable ag conference. Um, there's information on the conference out at the registration tables if anyone is interested in this, and you can register at the door. Uh, but the sustainable ag conference is going to be held in Oconee County at the Oconee County Civic Center. and the conference will be covering topics um, such as farm business planning, food safety, uh, farm equipment, marketing planning, um, and quite a few other topics. Uh, so we're looking forward to it. And there's gonna be representation at that conference from FSA, NRCS, um, and some other organizations. So thank you. Thank you, Amanda. <clears throat> and with that, we're, uh... We're going to have our speakers come up. We're going to have Dr. Ben Campbell come up and talk to us about the green industry first, and then he'll be followed by Dr. Levi Russell, uh, who will come up and talk about or talk about livestock and, and the various uh, row crops. And then we'll have Matt Howard come up and talk to us uh, about changing demographics in Georgia and nationally. So with that, I'd like to have Dr. Campbell come up and kick us off. Yeah, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Ben Campbell. I'm an assistant professor um, in the Department of Agriculture and Applied Economics uh, here at UGA. Uh, my sort of responsibilities are nursery, greenhouse, and turf grass. That's sort of my, uh, what I focus on. So today, uh, it's my pleasure to give sort of a special crop update looking at what's happening in the green industry. Uh, define specialty crops just for those who may not be aware. Specialty crops are defined basically fruits, vegetables, uh, ornamental plants, uh, Christmas trees, anything, generally not row crops, not livestock, is in the specialty crop category. What's very interesting about this uh, sector is that unlike a lot of different commodities, there's a lot of latitude in what we classify as specialty crops. So, you know, unlike row crops and other things, the specialty crop sector is very much a wide open with respect to how we, what we put in those categories. Um, and so it makes it interesting when we start defining specialty crops and what falls in there a little bit harder compared to some other commodities. 
Uh, just for to understand where we're going in the future, we need to understand where we, where we were in the past. So the Georgia green industry is the ninth ranked state in the uh, country with respect to the size, the, uh, the impact of the green industry has on the economy. So, you know, there's a lot of states out there. The Georgia's uh, the ninth uh, biggest state. Uh, roughly $7 billion in value uh, generated to the Georgia economy in 2013. Uh, so I think if you look in your ag forecast book in 2016, we're up over $8.1 billion that we're doing for the economy, which the industry is growing uh, fairly well, um, given coming out of the recession. Uh, roughly 65,000 jobs in 2013, that number's up um, from where it was uh, now compared to what it was in 2013. But we're contributing jobs, we're contributing uh, other growth uh, to the economy. Uh, you know, second ranked uh, economy, uh, second grade output in the Southeast behind Florida. So in the Southeast as well, the Georgia green industry has a large um, uh, impact on what's going on in the state, that ag portion of the state. So uh, with respect to Farmgate, we're the fifth biggest sector, ag sector in the state behind, I think it's boilers, uh, cotton, eggs, and beef. So, you know, as far as, output and the sort of magnitude of the what the grain industry has to economy quite big and considerably quite big uh comparatively to other uh commodities uh so where we were and where we're going so post recession we came out and the one thing the recession did it cleared out a lot of inefficient firms they were eliminated from the market so we had roughly a third of firms in the nursery greenhouse industry that went out of business coming out of the recession so not only that, we had a shrinking of production. I think roughly a 30% decrease in production uh, for the nursery and greenhouse as we came out. Same thing happened with respect to turf grass. We had a lot of firms that contracted. And so why that matters for today is, you know, those firms contracted, well, are they putting things back into production? And so we'll talk about that in a little bit, but this contraction that occurred is really impacting where we're going in the future with respect to prices and respect to production as we move forward. The one big thing that we see coming out of the recession is that compared to the U.S., Georgia was hit really hard. We had a lot more firms go out of business, and we had a lot more contraction compared to what the U.S. overall had. So we had this – Georgia was hit really hard with the recession and drought um, in the mid-2000s compared to the U.S. Uh, if you look, there's a graph on the top left. shows you sort of what happened coming out of the recession and where we're going uh, we see that, you know, production took a bottomed out uh, coming out of the recession. It is increasing. So we see, do see increasing uh, ha increases happening. Um, it's not that big sort of big shift back up. I mean, the economy is getting better, so everything shifts up. That's not what we see. We see that you see a slow growth in production, but we see stagnant prices. Prices are really not rising. Um, so in the last couple of years and even going in 2018, we're going to see prices roughly remain the same. Productions where a lot of the new supplies coming from with respect to where we're seeing the added value um, If you're interested in more detailed with respect to what happened in the recession and the effects of it on the industry Detailed by sector. There is an extension publication out there that details the green industry environmental horticulture What happened and where we're uh, sort of how the recession impacted Georgia green industry um, From the greenhouse side the turf grass side and all the different uh, subsectors within the industry uh, Coming out of the recession, we had a lot of firms that left the market. A lot of those firms that left the market were in more rural areas. The uh, major cities such as Atlanta and those areas weren't impacted as bad, right? Because they had a bigger population base, so thereby they were able to survive. The figure you're seeing on the screen now shows where these firms are located. What you really notice is these firms are really congregated around large metropolitan areas with big populations. The red being, the big red uh, blob in the middle is Atlanta, right? So there's a high density of firms that are located in Atlanta. Um, down in the south, Georgia, you see that the red there is toward, toward the Tall uh, Tallahassee market, right? So the firms now, as they're growing back, they're sort of not really coming back in the rural areas as much. They're really, you see growth coming back in these large areas, which is increasing competition with respect to as more firms come in. Now, how do you differentiate yourself compared to your other competitors? So the growth is really happening in these really metropolitan areas is where we see growth at the retail level. Uh, so one of the issues we really have with respect to compared to other commodities is trying to do a forecast. We don't have data, right? If we want row crop data or we want row crop forecast, we want livestock, USDA collects hourly, daily, monthly data. For the green industry, we don't have that, right? So we had a yearly uh, forecast or yearly data that the USDA stopped collecting in 2007 um, that was doing floriculture and ornamental horticulture. That's gone. 
uh, other things, uh, the census, that's not every year. So trying to construct a forecast of exactly what's gonna happen prices for next year or uh, cost next year, really we don't have that information. But the one thing we do have is this industry really relies on the economic impact of economic uh, growth or contraction of the economy. This is one of the big, big, one of the major industries with respect to what happens in the economy impacts directly what happens with growth of this industry. So we can use uh, weather data and to because weather is big for the industry, and we can use economic growth and projections there to try to understand where this industry is going. So the next couple of slides are going to be looking at economic growth of the U.S. and Georgia to try to get a handle on what's happening next. So in, there was a survey several years ago, and the biggest concerns that you see that the greenhouse uh, nursery side, the economy was the biggest concern, right? Because realizing that what happens on this econ economic side impacts. Think of home sales, right? You put in a new home, you're building a new home, what do you do? You buy plants to landscape, you buy grass, you buy all those things. So as home sales go up and as the economy improves, more disposable income, thereby we now see, you know, I mean, the industry grow if those things are positive. So US GDP, uh, when you look at this, I mean, the problem here is that there's a range. The good thing is all projections point to there's gonna be continued economic growth in the US next, this coming year, 2018. What we don't know is how big it's going to be. The estimates range between two and five percent. Five percent, green industry is excited, right? Two percent is roughly what happened last year in growth. So I mean, we see this positive growth expected in GDP. Thereby, we expect you know that we should see some growth in the industry, um, given compared to what we saw last year. I think that uh, if you look at it, I think roughly the projection was 2.4 percent um, by several sources. What the, their anticipated forecast for 2018 was, right? So that puts us in line with what happened last year. With Georgia specifically, if you look at where we were last year, 2.4% was the growth rate uh, for the Georgia State product. This year, roughly projection was 2.9%. So we continue to see growth. We see these things. What that means for us is using this as a proxy of sort of consumers' ability and willing to put in new homes, put in new uh, um, buy homes and buy plants, increase economic growth, bodes well for the industry moving forward. Uh, housing starts. Housing starts is one of the best predictors you can look at to try to figure out where we're going. Um, housing starts projected to go up. Um, what we did see was in the fall of 2017, we saw actually a, sort of a decrease um, compared to the uh, 2016 fall of um, housing starts, so the last quarter of 2016. We saw a fall in housing starts, but we're still, the expectation is that we will have more houses um, permitted to be built and being built coming into 2018. That's good news, right? Housing starts buy more plants, buy more turf grass, good news for the industry. So, you know, housing start, GDP expected to increase, housing starts expected to go up, two big good indicators that, I mean, we should see positive growth going forward in 2018 and beyond. Uh, Georgia, Georgia housing starts, same, same story as the U.S., we see positive growth, right? So Georgia specifically, we see this increase in uh, number of houses that are planned to be built, good news um, for the sector. Uh, unemployment claims, another, and again, these are different uh, indicators we can use to try to get a handle on what's happening with the economy, right? That's what we're trying to do. Where are we going? Uh, we see unemployment claims decreasing uh, both in the U.S. and decreasing in Georgia. You know, the good news about that, increase employment, increase people with disposable income, thereby now ability to maybe go out and buy plants. Coming out of the recession, what happened was people's incomes were stagnant or decreasing, thereby now one of the things they cut was buying plants, buying turf grass, buying those type of things. They cut it out of their budget. Now, as we see growth and we see people going back to work, now that allows for more of uh, the disposable income to go into buying these uh, plants and turf grass that helps the industry. So where are we going? Uh, what we think is gonna happen is we will see increased growth in the 2018. Uh, firms are really sort of scared or really risk averse with respect to drastically increasing production. You saw the graph we put up earlier, that I put up earlier, it had uh, slow growth of production. Well, that's what we think is gonna happen coming into 2018 for nursery and greenhouse. Farms aren't just putting all the acreage back into service that they had, you know, so they're taking a sort of a modest approach. So we think that production is gonna increase uh, compared to 2017, but it's gonna be modest growth. We're not gonna see large acreage come back in into play. Uh, with respect to the uh, consumer side, you're gonna see the growth with respect to disposable income that are buying more, they're using these, uh, their income to buy more products. 
the big thing on the demand side, we're going to see probably, we're going to see strong growth in the spring, assuming weather cooperates. We're one of the only industries that has, that cares about if it rains on Friday and Saturday, right? Row crops, rains on Friday and Saturday, don't care. Nursery greenhouse, it rains on Friday, Saturday, people don't come buy plants, right? So, you know, trying to forecast what's going to happen on specific days of the week with respect to precipitation, really hard. But if we get rain coming in the spring and it rains on uh, Friday and Saturday, you know, people don't buy plants and, you know, sales go down. Uh, with respect to what's happening with respect to this colder winter, it was projected to be a milder winter. I don't think we got that. So, you know, those farms that are putting things in uh, to grow, production costs probably went up to try to heat those greenhouses um, and protect those nursery crops because of the increased, increased uh, heating costs needed to uh, get plants to survive. So spring, depending on weather, hopefully it doesn't rain Friday and Saturdays. Uh, moving into summer, I think we'll have sort of stable growth. The big issue I think we're going to have and what we're seeing is fall plant sales is generally tanked for a lot of people. Uh, people have moved away from planting things in the fall. And so if that's the case, you know, one of the big issues in 2018 is going to be trying to figure out how do we correct that? How do we get people to move and buy plants in the fall? Everyone knows buy plants in the spring, so we'll see growth there. But getting that growth back in 2018 with respect to the fall sales, I think somewhere we need to look at. Um, so other things I think are important for the industry. Labor, labor is going to be one of the big things that happens in 2018. We don't know what's happening policy-wise, given this industry really focuses on is labor intensive. Nursery greenhouse is labor intensive. How do we deal with different policies if we can't get workforce, right? Uh, you know, I think that's going to be one of the big issues that the industry is going to have to struggle with, um, with respect to uh, how do we deal with uh, if we can't find labor. Others, water, depending on what happens in the Supreme Court. Um, I gave a seminar on water at the uh, Georgia Green Industry uh, Association meeting, and the question I asked is, what happens if the water decision comes down and they put a cap on water usage? And I asked that for nursery greenhouse growers, and the answer was, I don't know, right? So if there's a cap on water, input prices go, are going to go up. You know, I think water is going to be a big issue for us to figure out as a green industry. How do you deal with something, a bad decision coming out of water if it limits your water use? Um, so those are some big things happening in nursery greenhouse that I think we need to prepare for. Um, other things happening, uh, labor-wise, that we're seeing a move towards more mechanization. We see a move towards people putting in and trying to put in uh, to limit the impact of uh, lack of labor. Uh, so moving into adding production efficiencies to lower costs or to uh, mitigate any impact on labor uh, shortages. So labor is going to be in putting in machinery and uh, mechanization is going to be big coming up in 2018. Other things we see that's going to happen is trying to find new niche products. You know, if you're a smaller firm, trying to find that niche, trying to find a product that is going to, uh, you know, give you more profitability is going to be something really to focus on. And then the impact of different production practices that are being mandated by bigger stores, such as uh, Home Depot and Lowe's, such as neonicotinoids. Uh, the ban so Home Depot and Lowe's ban neonicotinoids to try to help pollinators. You know, as a producer, how do you deal with that mandate coming down from above? You know, I think that's going to be a something we really struggle with and have to figure out how do we do this? How do we absorb production costs and mitigate production costs going forward? Uh, that's one of the big issues I think we're going to be dealing with that on the production side. Uh, with respect to a turf grass, Clint Waltz does a turf grass survey. Uh, he posts it every, every year online. Um, he surveys uh, turf grass producers to get an idea of what's happening forecast for this coming year. Um, if you're doing anything with turf grass or want to know about it, uh, I would suggest this uh, publication he does gives a really good insightful uh, view of the turf grass industry and sort of what's happening in 2018. Uh, so what we see is some of the biggest areas is still going to be um, landscape, landscape services, landscape construction is going to still be the biggest area. Uh, we see movement along with golf courses and those type of things as people have more disposable income, guess what we do? We will go play golf, right? So as the, as the, uh, the economy improves, we're going to see people moving and doing all these activities. Thereby, we think golf courses is going to be one of the big areas where turf grass is going to be moving towards. Um, so, uh, but still, land study services continue to be putting in for new homes, right? So new homes being built, more grass being put in. Uh, Production-wise, the big thing to see from these two graphs is that compared to several years ago, it looks like we're sort of – have a good handle on how much production we're going to need for various turf grass varieties, such as Bermuda grass and zoysia grass. Now we have an idea of, we sort of know where consumers are going to be. And so supply wise, we're getting more confident. We're estimating it right. So you're not seeing large increases in, uh, in uh, of, uh, production areas. You see firms now sort of, they have an idea where they want to be and to meet supply needs. And so since 2015, a thousand acres have been added. Um, so not, not a lot. 
uh, being added. It sounds like a lot, but it's not a lot compared to total acreage. But we see this growth um, coming, but it's very, very slow. Farms are somewhat happy where they're at production-wise. They're happy with prices, and we don't see this sudden increase. And in, um, we don't expect a sudden increase in turf grass production to occur next year, this coming year. Uh, prices generally, generally really stagnant as well. I say stagnant, they're higher than what they were uh, several years ago, but we don't see a 2018 increase in turf grass prices. Generally, people are happy with their production levels. They're happy with their um, uh, pricing levels. So we're not going to see uh, turf grass prices fluctuate up and down much. The expectation is they're going to rain, rain really where they were in 2017. Uh, Cost-wise, roughly the same story. Cost, we're not seeing a huge increase or decrease for the most part. We do see, if you look at the chart, you'll see that there are some varieties where you have big fluctuation, like one of them is a 12% decrease. Uh, but by and large, everything's roughly 2017 levels. So for turf grass, you know, production's pretty much in one of that sort of range. Prices are in the range where they were in 2017, and costs are going to be in the, so, that same area. So we're not seeing huge drastic uh, changes from 2017 to 2018. Uh, the expectation industry goes as the economy goes. Um, turf grass may be more so than the, green, uh, the nursery greenhouse. Uh, we see that uh, landscape services is going to be the big sector again. No change there from 2017. So uh, we see the production. I mean, is going to be. We're not. The big thing here is we're not seeing firms really put in massive amounts of production on nursery greenhouse or turf grass. We're slowly building back to where we were in uh, 2007, 2008. So there's a modest growth going on. Um, other factors, again, water and labor are still going to be big issues. I mean, if they come back and say, hey, you can only water so much, you know, you know, are we developing new varieties that can deal with that? I think that's going to be the varietal shift to try to deal with drought tolerance and things like that. Uh, labor as well, you know, if we come back and we can't harvest, um, you know, maybe turf grass is a little bit different than nursery greenhouse, but labor and water are going to be the two big issues that are going to impact us in 2018, depending on what happens with policy in Washington and the Supreme Court decision coming down in uh, about the uh, water wars, but if they cap Georgia water usage, ag is going to be one of the biggest hit industries. And how does the nursery, nursery greenhouse, how to turf, how do they deal with that? I think that's the big things in 2018 from a trends perspective or cost perspective. What are we going to be dealing with? Um, that being said, that is a quick overview of where we're going nursery greenhouse wise and turf wise, um, the green industry in 2018. All right, we're going to see some growth. Price is really not rising that much, really driven by demand being driven by the economy with respect to how we're moving. And I don't know if we have a good handle on what's going to happen in 2018 with respect to where's the economy going. If you look at leading up to the last couple of days, we'd say, oh, we're going to be boom. After the couple, last couple of days in stock market, you know, is it going to be as big a growth? Right? I think that's where we don't know. And forecast is we will move forward um, at least be 20, 2017 levels, if not demand moving a little bit higher. So that's Nursery Greenhouse. Um, so if you have questions, please see me after, and I'll be happy to discuss anything with you. Thanks. So unlike my esteemed colleague, I'm not afraid to admit that I'm shorter than uh, Kent. So I'm going to move this microphone. There we go. That's a little better. So my name is Levi Russell. I'm a, a professor in the Ag and Applied Economics Department. Uh, my, my primary um, area of specialization is what I like to call uh, everything that has feet that you eat. Um, and so I'm mainly in the livestock world, but um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, just about everything um, outside of the uh, nursery and greenhouse stuff here. And so I'm going to start off <clears throat> talking about uh, the livestock, uh, excuse me, the, the cattle side. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the interesting thing about cattle um, right now, I think, is that we're kind of uh, in this phase of, of rebuilding our herd uh, from a pretty dramatic um, decline nationwide. And um, Georgia's herd is still down quite a bit, uh, even though sort of nationwide our numbers have been uh, growing. And uh, we just recently got a report out that's, uh, that indicated that, uh, you know, we had some growth uh, in the herd over the last year, but um, <clears throat> the, uh, we, we really did uh, slow down um, our, uh, how many replacements we're holding back um, on the uh, replacement heifers we're holding back. And so I think we're gonna see slower growth this year. Um, and potentially uh, level that off, which will 
uh, sort of mean, you know, uh, positive pressure for prices, especially the cow-calf level. You know, Georgia uh, is primarily a cow-calf uh, state, and so we have a lot of mama cows out there, um, you know, uh, raising calves and, and for the most part uh, selling those calves into the Midwest where they are, uh, where they graze for a period of time and then go into a feedlot. Um, so usually, so here, I, what I'm normally talking about is, is calves that are weaned um, in the state and, and what the prices are for those calves. That's typically what I'm focusing on. Uh, but you can see here a graph of uh, cattle slaughter. Uh, slaughter rates have been increasing over the last uh, few years. And if you break this down into, uh, you know, mama cows and uh, heifers, um, those groups have been increasing as well. A lot of my graphs will look like this. You'll have a, a red line that's a five-year average, a dotted line that's the previous year, and then the blue line is the current, uh, current year's numbers. And some of these will be updated for 18 and some of them won't, but this one is updated for 2018. Uh, but you can see there that you know, cattle, the pace of cattle slaughter uh, every week um, that has picked up relative to that five-year average. And this year, um, we're doing pretty well um, in terms of, um, you know, increasing our pace of slaughter. We've, we've got a bigger herd now than we did a few years ago. And so we kind of have a healthy market, I think, where, you know, those calves are <clears throat> sort of efficiently moving through um, our feedlot system. You know, our feedlots have done a really good job of, uh, you know, putting calves on feed and then marketing them at, a, uh, at, a, at the appropriate time. <clears throat> I think that, you know, in addition to that, uh, the consumer has really helped us out as well in the sense that, um, you know, our retail prices have been uh, relatively strong. Uh, you can see them kind of falling off a little bit relative to uh, 2016 there uh, last year. But, um, you know, the, the real bright spot and the real kind of hard to predict thing for us uh, on the econ side has been, you know, just what will the consumer do? Um, you know, we saw back in 14 and 15, you know, extremely high beef prices uh, when, you know, our supply was really low. Um, and so, it has been interesting to see you know, sort of a shift in the consumer perception, I think, um, and sort of having a, a, little, uh, a little healthier attitude, I think, about you know, beef and, and all of these meat products really as a, as a healthy product, uh, you know, protein, focusing on protein, and you know, not worrying so much about you know, some of these older claims that you know, dietary fat is really bad for your heart and all this sort of thing. Um, I think you know, as we update the science on that, um, I think it's been really good as the consumer has figured out that, you know, these products are really healthy. Um, so, you know, retail prices, you know, over the next year, uh, really are going to kind of run into a problem where, you know, we're going to be eating more beef here in the U.S. We're going to be exporting, uh, you know, a, a little bit more. Um, but, you know, the question is going to be, um, you know, as we continue to increase our production of beef, uh, you know, how, how much pressure is that going to put on prices? And we've really seen a shift where, you know, beef prices are a lot more dependent on uh, folks' incomes than they are on, you know, how much beef is out there, how much pork and how much poultry are out there, sort of as those competing products. Um, so, you know, again, as, <clears throat> as the economy continues to, I think, uh, sort of move along pretty well, uh, I think that bodes well uh, for cattle producers in general. Uh, I'd like to show this slide because I think it does a good job of showing, you know, profitability and, and uh, kind of what we expect for, you know, herd development over time. And so you can see those really high profit years in 14 and 15 consistent with those really high prices that we had. Now at the time I was in Texas, an economist in Texas, uh, especially the West, well, on the on kind of the Western and Southern part. And, uh, you know, I wasn't saying high profit year because, you know, the Western U.S. is where a lot of that drought was coming in and why we were getting lower herd, uh, lower herd numbers. And so they weren't, they didn't have a lot of profitability because they just didn't have calves. Okay. And so, um, you know, it was a different story for some of them, I think. But um, you can see we had a negative profit year there um, in 2016. Again, consistent with prices falling pretty dramatically, but inputs kind of staying high. Um, and then uh, last year, uh, positive profitability. And again, this, this, uh, this whole thing is, is uh, really this, this negative profit year in 16 and, you know, lower profit year in 17 has helped to kind of slow down our expansion of the herd. Uh, you know, when there's positive profitability, we tend to see growth of the herd. When there's negative profitability, we tend to see the herd decline. Um, and so over the next couple of years here, you can see those forecasts for kind of 
you know, sort of even money or, you know, maybe a little bit of positive profitability, a little bit of negative. And again, this is nationwide. Um, you know, I think, again, we're going to see sort of our, our herd kind of flatten out a little bit here um, over time. And so what does that mean for Georgia prices? Well, um, <clears throat> you know, you can see here uh, that five-year average uh, being relatively high uh, as it's capturing, you know, those really high prices in 14 and 15. Um, but you can see last year, you know, we had a couple of big drops there in the spring and then in the late, uh, late summer and into the fall. Um, and, and really that drop in the fall is, is you know, sort of normal, except that it was just really a, a really large drop. Normally we see a drop during that period, but uh, it really just fell really far. Um, we did see recovery, thanks again, I think, to the demand side. We, we saw box beef prices go up at the end of the year, wholesale beef prices, in other words. And I think that really helped pull up calf prices. Um, and so, you know, this, this past year, we've kind of had, you know, what I would think would be a normal year consistent with the prices that we had at the end of 16. In other words, we kind of had some price appreciation through the spring. Um, and then, you know, prices sort of softened through, this, uh, through the summer there and kind of uh, hit a low point sort of uh, in an early fall period and then rebounded up <clears throat> through the end of the year. And so as I look ahead, you know, there are some concerns um, on the beef side, I think from the, from the consumer that, you know, if we, if we really do get lots of extra production uh, on the beef side, and then additionally in, in poultry and, uh, and pork, um, there's certainly a concern um, that, you know, as we, as we produce more and more of that product, that we're gonna see prices fall, and then that will start to move its way back to the cow-calf level, you know, pushing calf prices down um, at some point during the year. But, you know, the, the best forecast um, is, is the stock market, or is, is the futures market, I think. And um, right now, the futures forecast, I've got one up there. That I, I, this was calculated last week, but um, beefbasis.com is a fantastic website uh, put together by some extension folks in the Midwest um, where you can actually forecast uh, cash beef prices, or cash, uh, excuse me, calf prices in your, uh, at your barn's location. Um, and so on a specific date. So if you call me up and say, you know, hey, what's the, what's the forecast for my calves on, you know, October 15th next year? Well, all I'm gonna do is go to beefbasis.com and plug that in, okay? So <laughs> you can save yourself a trip and just go ahead and do that. But uh, it's a really great website. Um, you know, so like I say, I think we're gonna see seasonal pattern of prices next year consistent with where we've been, you know, um, but we, we do have some downside risk uh, in terms of um, looking at the consumer side of things. Um, onto the poultry, <clears throat> uh, really the, the story for the next three commodities I'm gonna discuss is about the same. And that is uh, over the last few years, we've seen cheap feed really drive a lot of increases in production. And those increases in production have, um, uh, you know, exposed, you know, a, a lot of risk uh, for, again, the demand side, right? If we, we producing a lot more of these products over the next couple of years, and you can see forecasts here um, into 2019, excuse me, um, you know, poultry, poultry production increasing year over year um, over the next couple of years, and that, uh, that light blue in 18 and uh, the brown there for 19. And as we continue to see those production increases over time, um, you know, we're gonna really expose ourselves to a lot of risk on the price side. And in fact, on the poultry side, we've already seen, um, uh, you know, we're, well, we're, we're expecting to see some, uh, some, uh, some weakness in price for the coming year. Um, but, and, and here you can see on the retail side, that blue line down there being lower than uh, the 2016 line, the dotted line. Um, so on the retail side, we have seen some weakness um, uh, for chicken. Um, with some notable exceptions, uh, wing prices last year were absolutely uh, off the charts crazy high for a good portion of the year. Um, and so I think a lot of that has to do with incomes. You know, people are going to uh, go out to the bar or whatever and get some wings. You know, that's a, those wings are very uh, high priced uh, component of the whole bird. Um, and so again, I think we're, we're really seeing an income effect in here. And I think that, that does bode well, really well for beef. But um, on, the, on the poultry side, the chicken side, I think it's, it has less of an impact on that retail price. Um, as we look at broiler prices, uh, you can see that blue line for 2018 um, is, is actually up relative to last year. And you can see last year, we're sort of playing around that uh, five-year average. 
uh, you know, broiler prices um, have, uh, are, again, this year are doing a little bit better. Um, and I think, again, part of that has to do with, I think we're, we're, we're sort of uncertain about how much demand there is out there. Um, but again, the, the general forecasts are um, that, you know, we're going to continue to see low feed costs. Um, and that's going to continue to drive production increases. And, and we're just not seeing where the home is going to be for that product um, such that it's going to keep prices up. And so if we look at USDA forecasts, we're going to see those prices soften in 2018. Um, and, you know, potentially, uh, you know, our, our profitability, even though it was pretty good in 2017, um, you know, we're going to see that soften somewhat um, in 2018 um, as those prices, uh, you know, fall. We're going to see increased domestic consumption because it has to go somewhere, okay? But, uh, you know, exports are really going to be a big deciding factor. And, and you know, folks, I, I don't like to talk about the political stuff, but, you know, these trade issues, um, especially when we think about Asian markets, are really key for the poultry side. And so, you know, if we can get some movement on, um, you know, opening up some new markets and things like that or strengthening those markets is really good, um, I think, on the poultry side. Um, looking at dairy now. <clears throat> Again, similar story with those low, uh, low feed prices have really driven increases in the herd. Um, and of course, you know, um, as with anything in these highly integrated industries, we continue to see, you know, improvements in efficiency, um, you know, sort of on a, so on a per cow basis, right? The, each cow is producing more milk um, and, and uh, we're also getting more cows. And so you can see our milk production continues to increase here. Um, <clears throat> and we look at milk production forecasts uh, for 2018 there in the brown, again, a, a slight increase over 17. Um, and so, you know, again, that's, that's not a, uh, another increase in production is not a positive thing for price, um, but uh, we're, we're slowing down. We're beginning to see a slowdown in that increase in production, again, due to sort of the herd starting to um, slow down its growth a little bit. Um, but the real challenge, I think, is the stocks of uh, milk products that we have. And so if we look at butter and cheese, um, we've got a lot of that stuff in cold storage right now. And it's really just making it hard for us to see any sort of positive headway in prices on dairy side, because uh, again, if we've got just a lot of that stock hanging out there and we're continuing to have increases in production, it's hard to see a way for you know, prices to come up, right? Sort of basic supply and demand. And so if we look at, uh, you know, milk prices in Georgia, uh, and again, this is sort of a, you know, Georgia prices are typically 2 to $3 above kind of the USDA uh, numbers. And so we're going to see those prices somewhere uh, between, you know, the, the high $17 range to uh, the high $20 range next year, which is off a little bit, uh, a little bit lower uh, than last year's prices. Um, <clears throat> So again, just a few summary items here, and, and y'all have an opportunity to have this presentation if you want to. Um, so, you know, below trend growth for our milk, you know, in terms of looking at how much growth we're going to have, uh, you know, I say decline from 2017. What I mean is we're not growing as fast as we did in 17. Um, you know, those large butter and cheese stocks, again, are not really helping us out too much in terms of price. Um, and then I have a range here. Uh, well, I should say 1790. I guess I got that wrong. Sorry about that. 1790 to the $20.80 range uh, throughout the year with sort of a normal seasonal kind of cycle. Um, on to the, <clears throat> the hog side of things. Um, you know, again, w w it's this idea of low feed costs really driving increases in production. And you can see that's, uh, you know, certainly the case on the hog side, as we've seen hog slaughter uh, increasing over the last couple of years. And, and there's, a, there's a chart in your book there uh, that's really interesting. It shows uh, our, our fall capacity for slaughter. Um, and you can see that in, six, in 15, 16, and then in 17, it doesn't show a 17, but um, in the fall of each of those last three years, we've seen, um, you know, the, our production in the fall uh, it go beyond uh, the, the capacity or the sort of the, the normal sustainable capacity for slaughter. And so that has created a lot of um, uh, new uh, uh, slaughter capacity being built over the last couple of years. And we're going to continue to see more of that built here in 2018. And what that's really done is increase a lot of competition for those, uh, those finished animals and has, and has kind of helped to pull up uh, finished hog prices, um, you know, throughout the year. And so again, I think we're going to see another 
uh, big year in terms of uh, hog production, hog slaughter. Uh, and indeed the USDA forecasts are gonna bear that out as well. Um, 18 in the light blue and 19 in the brown. We're gonna see some pretty big increases in pork production over the next couple of years, which again, uh, creates a challenge of finding a home for that. Now, the recent USDA forecast that has come out um, has actually been a little bit positive, a little bit more positive than the December forecast was uh, for pork prices, uh, excuse me, for hog prices. And so, um, you know, I think there's some positive uh, uh, attitudes out there about sort of finding a home for that product, uh, especially on the export side. And so as we look at profitability, this is sort of a, uh, an, Iowa, this is an Iowa number uh, from my, my friend Lee Schultz up at Iowa State, but um, it's kind of an indicator, I think, for the country as a whole. And so you can see past that blue line, uh, you know, mostly positive profitability throughout the next year. Um, but in the 19 is where we're, we're expecting to see, uh, you know, some, some real softening of those uh, uh, hog prices, which uh, even which even though we are expecting, again, those low feed costs um, are going to start to drive <clears throat> sort of unhedged profitability uh, lower uh, in 19. <clears throat> so if we, again, just to sort of recap here, uh, above, cap above capacity slaughter in 16, uh, those continued low feed costs are really um, helping to drive production increases. Um, domestic consumption is going to increase, but uh, we're still going to see some uh, ending stocks that are higher. So um, <clears throat> as far as keeping a floor under those finished animal prices, you know, we, we've seen a lot more competition uh, from, from the slaughter folks, but uh, 2019 is gonna be a tough year, I think. Um, now, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm, I'm not a pollinator expert, and there's a great article in that book for you to read on this, but I'm just gonna read you some highlights uh, here. And so, you know, honeybee popularity, in terms of, you know, folks wanting to use, uh, to, to, to um, you know, have honeybees on their property, um, still rising, but overall production in Georgia has been below average, uh, which is kind of consistent with the last few years. Um, our nectar flows are down. And so when we think about, you know, colony failure, we've heard a lot about this colony collapse disorder and things like this. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, we've had, uh, you know, favorable temperatures and good weather allowing the bees to forage, um, but, but we have seen uh, increase in brood production, um, you know, that's allowed uh, varroa populations uh, to increase, which is uh, not a good thing for those bees. Um, in terms of pollination services, um, <clears throat> starting in January of this year, we started to see those, um, uh, you know, bees going from Georgia out west uh, to, to kind of do their job with those trees. And uh, contract fees for pollinating almonds uh, will be higher this year. So apparently the almond folks are doing well, and so they're going to uh, sort of pay it, pay it forward a little bit um, into the bees. And so with that, uh, talking about pollinators, I'll move on to uh, discussing our row crop stuff here. Um, <clears throat> in terms of cotton, of course, you know, Georgia is the number two cotton state in the country uh, behind Texas and uh, it's a very important crop for the state. <clears throat> in terms of uh, acreage, we're likely to see increases in uh, acreage, um, but production, you know, that, that's always uh, of course, dependent on the weather and things like that. The uh, farm bill is going to be a, 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 a certainly an important uh, part of all of this. Um, if we're going to see uh, some kind of a program to put uh, uh, um, put in place for cotton, whether that's going to be a seed cotton program, um, which is coming from one side of the, the, the Congress, or a cotton seed program. So it's, it's sort of a strange naming, and we can talk about that later if you'd like. Um, at lunchtime, but um, <clears throat> you know, it remains to be seen if we'll if we'll if we'll see cotton go back into uh, the program into the farm bill as a program crop. Um, world cotton use has improved, so that's good in terms of having a, a, an export market for the U.S. So export markets uh, share has increased for the U.S. and uh, overall use is up, and so that's a good thing. You know, we we like more demand for that product. Um, the big the big question is going to be China. Um, use and their their need for exports. So they have sort of a gap between their production and how much they're using. And so, uh, you know, in terms of filling that gap is, is potentially a, a, an opportunity. <clears throat> On the other hand here, <clears throat> uh, you know, one of the big things that we economists like to look at in terms of trying to forecast prices is our ending stocks to use. 
And so if we're, if we're increasing these stocks over time, in other words, we have you know, so much, we have uh, production that exceeds uh, our use for that year, right? We're gonna have more cotton being stored, right? And the more we have, co more cotton we have being stored, the tougher it's gonna be, right, for prices to come up, right? So it's sort of a negative relationship. So we get higher ending stocks, we have lower prices. And so uh, for the next couple of years, uh, in the past here, we've seen, uh, again, uh, increases in supply um, that, that really haven't, uh, and, and the demand side hasn't caught up, hasn't been keeping up with that. <clears throat> so we've seen those ending stocks increase over the last couple of years. Um, so the market's been increasing, uh, has been anticipating an acreage increase, um, and we're likely to see one, but um, you know, there's, there's other factors out there in terms of um, exports and things like that for, for markets to sort of uh, pay attention to. Um, we, we could see, um, you know, prices weaken if we get a really big acreage number um, or if, you know, our production, uh, you know, really the, the bottom line is going to be production. If that production sort of uh, beats expectations and that's where we could see some negative uh, for the price. Um, <clears throat> but we need, uh, you know, it's important for our, uh, you know, demand for, for exports. I think uh, it's something on the order of 70%, 70 to 75% of U.S. cotton is exported. Um, and so <clears throat> those export markets are, are very important in terms of maintaining those prices. <clears throat> but looking at the futures market and trying to sort of predict where we're going to be um, at harvest time, you know, we're, we're probably going to be somewhere in the 70 to 78 cent range, which, you know, the bottom end of that is probably uh, below sort of a break-even profitability number. Um, but there's at least, you know, if you're a little more optimistic, you know, we, we, we have that tighter range there at the top that I think would, would have some positive profitability in it um, in terms of Georgia production. Uh, <clears throat> so sort of a mixed outlook on the cotton side, really depending on, uh, you know, what kind of production numbers we get and, and where our exports end up. But, but I think in general, we're sort of in a, in a, at least have some potential for profitability in there with those prices. Looking at the peanut side, <clears throat> of course, uh, Georgia is a very large producer of peanuts. And so, you know, our acreage here and our production here makes a, a big dent in, or it makes up a large percentage of the total U.S. Uh, production. And so you can see here, just got planted acres, harvested acres, and then yield for Georgia and the U.S. over time from 15 through 17. Uh, and you know, we've seen our planted acres go up in the US and also in Georgia. You can see that from 16 to 17. Um, and uh, yields have improved um, in both cases. Um, and then and those harvested acres again, so planted versus harvested, you know, if we have crop losses and things like that. Um, but <clears throat> those have increased as well. And so, you know, this again, this uh, larger production uh, potentially uh, is, gonna, is gonna put a damper on um, you know, prices are at least uh, not, not going to put upward pressure on them. And see that red line there, that's our production. And then the blue line below it is consumption or use. Okay. And so you can see when, uh, when that blue line's above the red line, those bars are getting lower, right? And those bars are our ending stocks. In other words, what we have left. Um, but you can see for the 17 and 18 crop year, okay, which is the current crop year, um, the forecasts are for uh, that production to go above our use, right? And so then we're going to start building stocks. And that tends to have a negative, uh, will tend to have a negative pressure, put negative pressure on prices. Um, it's not as easy to use that number, that ending stocks number to forecast the peanut side. Um, and you can see uh, runner peanut prices here um, have actually increased um, over the past few months. Um, you know, again, uh, whenever we see things like this and you know, we look at 2012 and 13 with you know very high crop prices in general um, it's hard to it's hard to not keep that number in your mind you can see that really high point there for peanut prices um, but you know whenever we have those really high numbers it's hard to it's hard to think more about sort of the normal markets right and so we're sort of uh, kind of on on average or up a little bit if we if we consider that that big bump in the middle there to be sort of an anomaly and not not typical. Um, so we'll have lower prices on 
Uh, those other commodities combined with the PLC payments have increased peanut acres in Georgia. So, you know, uh, with, with cotton folks uh, struggling uh, in terms of having uh, uh, program payments, um, that's really shifted a lot of acres into peanuts. And so, get a lot more production. Um, you know, we've, we've seen some farmers abandon their rotations, right? So, they're going to have a rotation that kind of mitigates disease issues and things like that. When they abandon that rotation, you know, it, it can lead to problems down the road with yield and, and costs going up. Uh, and things like that to try to deal with those disease issues. Um, <clears throat> un uncontracted uh, 2017 peanut crop offers are currently at 375, um, and the 2018 crop um, is in the range of 370 to 400, um, but there's some limited opportunities to get that, uh, to get some of those, those numbers closer to the 400 mark. Um, we're still expecting sort of uh, more production, um, but uh, you know, if, if the farm bill comes out a little better for the cotton side of things this time than back in 14, uh, then you know, we could see things shake up a little different on the acreage uh, here in Georgia on the peanut side. So looking at corn, and again, before you know, I was, uh, I was on the livestock side, I, I have the, the luxury of talking about cheap feed and then not, uh, not having to deal with the repercussions on the, on the crop side. But uh, at this point, I'm, I, it's not gonna be so good for me. Um, and so you can see again here, uh, U.S. acres declining, and really um, that is a function of uh, if we look at sort of the the Corn Belt uh, area, the I states I call them Iowa, Indiana, Illinois. Um, <clears throat> you know, this these past couple of years we've seen you know uh, started to see folks move more into the soybean side and planted more soybean acres than corn, and so that has. Uh, you know, pl driven down those planted acres, you can see there for the US total, and really driven them down here in Georgia as well. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, if we look at, again, that production and use relationship, um, they're pretty close actually uh, for the corn side. But again, we're still gonna be building those stocks and that green line, the stocks to use ratio that sort of tells us about supply and demand both at the same time uh, is gonna be increasing. And so we're not gonna see a lot of positive movement um, on corn prices, and you can see that here. You know, those stocks are low. You can see those prices are much higher. And when those stocks build, you know, we don't see a lot of positive movement. But you can see again, we, we, we again have this anomaly, this, you know, this few years here, we had really high prices. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to pencil out a return to that in terms of looking at the, the current production situation. Um, and so we really need, I think, to think about those as sort of a, an off year, a, an atypical time frame. Um, that we that we wouldn't see necessarily. Um, U.S. corn acres likely to decrease in 2018 again because you know the folks in the Midwest are looking at corn versus soybeans, and if soybean prices are a little bit better, you know they're probably going to be planting more of those. Um, you know ethanol continues to grow basically with use, so we're not getting more ethanol per gallon, but you know as people drive more, then you know, we're, we're using, we're, we're, we're producing more ethanol. And so that, that demand is still there uh, for, the, for that corn product. <clears throat> um, you know, exports are a big question. And of course, the South American crops are always a uh, big determinant of uh, where, where we go with world prices. Um, and, and, you know, sort of we live in the world. And so it's, it's, it's going to be a big effect on uh, prices here. And so a forecast there for Georgia prices between 407 and 422. Um, on the soybean side, <clears throat> You can see again that pickup in U.S. acres, but still a drop here in Georgia. Again, consistent with that uh, sort of move into peanuts um, that we that we saw again relative to the cotton side of things. Uh, so we'll see record U.S. production on the soybean side, which you know, again, if you're a poultry producer, that's a good thing. If you're a soybean grower, uh, not so much. Um, if we look over here, uh, again, we're going to see sort of a situation where again that red line, that production line, is is above our use. Okay, and so again, we're going to be building stocks. Our stock to use ratio is going to go up, and we're going to again see negative pressure on prices uh, for the soybean side. And you can see that here um, as well, looking at those higher ending stocks being associated with uh, lower prices there. So the Georgia price in terms of soybeans between 940 and 962. Uh, looking at the wheat side of things, reduced acres in the U.S. And again, we're seeing a lot of competition uh, from Russia. Uh, last year's wheat crop was really tough in the Midwest based on uh, some, some quality issues in terms of uh, drought and things like that. And so, uh, you know, wheat has had a hard time, I think, uh, nationwide, just again, based on that, that competition 
uh, from, uh, from outside the US. And, but we are gonna get into a situation here where production in the US is gonna drop below, um, below our use, our expected use. And so you can see that that bar there for ending stocks is falling for 2017-18 crop relative to the previous crop. So, you know, is that gonna be positive pressure on wheat prices? Uh, I think hard to tell, uh, again, based on, you know, if, if production is increasing on a worldwide scale elsewhere, um, you know, it may, may sort of be hard to pencil that out. Um, <clears throat> so we'll see uh, kind of, again, maintaining that low wheat price in, in Georgia here uh, between $4 and $4.27. Um, looking at inputs, <clears throat> so we like to kind of look ahead a little bit about sort of where our uh, seed fertilizer and things like that are going to be. Uh, seed prices are going to be up slightly, uh, fertilizer up slightly. Um, so we, we've got our numbers there uh, that, are, that are in our, uh, our budgets, uh, nitrogen at 42, uh, 42 cents, um, and then P and K at uh, 39 and 28 respectively. Uh, diesel fuel will likely be up in the 210 to 250 range, um, and chemical prices are mixed, so you know some up and some down. Uh, machinery labor and interest up slightly, and again, you know, if we've got a growing economy, uh, you know, if we're seeing oil prices recover out of a, a real low spot, you know, we're, we're going to see higher fertilizer prices. We're going to see those higher machinery, uh, you know, interest rates are going to be coming up. You know, the Fed has uh, increased rates I think three times last year. And so we're going to see some positive pressure on those as well. And I think it's all sort of consistent with a growing economy, increases in technology on the seed side. It's going to push up seed prices. Um, so I think we're going to continue to see that despite those low, uh, those low crop prices. Um, and <clears throat> the folks down in Tifton do a great job, I think, doing some uh, penciling out some numbers and looking at sort of relative profitability for these different crops. And so I'll just kind of you know, point out a few things here. And so in this, in this purple circle, we've got uh, net return per acre above variable cost. Okay, so that's sort of above your cash cost, right? Uh, except we're excluding, you know, land rent, right? So if, we're, we, if we own our acres, right, this is gonna be return over our cash cost here. And you can see uh, soybeans coming in uh, pretty high there, uh, along with cotton. And then kind of a step down from that is on the corn and peanut side and then grain sorghum being really low. Um, and then if we look, if we subtract out our land rent, which I believe they have at something like $200, um, yeah, $200, uh, it, you know, we're gonna see sorghum go into the negative there. And this is for irrigated, by the way. Um, and again, maintaining those same relationships there. So again, uh, cotton and soybeans being uh, sort of at the top profitability wise and then peanuts and corn being a step down. On the dry land side, uh, you know, a little bit of a different story with cotton being the, the, the best out of the group, uh, and then peanuts and soy, soybeans kind of being down a little bit, uh, and then corn and sorghum being pretty even uh, in terms of looking at uh, profitability. And just, you know, a comment on this whole, uh, you know, we've been discussing a lot, I think, in, in the ag econ profession about financial stress and this sort of down period we're having in profitability, uh, especially on the row crop side. Um, you know, just like these really high prices in 12 and that time frame, you know, that, that, that bounteous time is kind of a blip on the radar. And so, you know, when we think about, you know, financial, the financial side of this, when we think about, you know, talking to your banker about operating loans and things like that, uh, you know, family living withdrawals is a, you know, is, is potentially a, an item that, you know, we might want to look at to try to adjust to some extent, given that, you know, we're, again, we're going to see continued low prices for these products, um, you know, looking at replacing equipment and things like that. Is there something we can do on the machinery side to sort of forestall some of this um, land rent, you know, looking at, you know, potentially, uh, you know, doing a little bit with less acres and things like that. Um, but, but I think that the bottom line is, is really paying attention to markets and, and, and finding those opportunities to, uh, you know, do your best on hedging and things like that. Uh, to find opportunities to take advantage of those and really being able to pencil out your costs and know what those costs are so you know you break even, right? If you know you break even, you're in a, you're in a position to be profitable um, when, the markets, when the markets are right. So uh, knowing those costs well, and I think, I think the, the folks in Tifton do a great job with, with their budgets and uh, I sure hope I do a decent job with mine. So um, you can always look at those to put in your numbers and try to 
uh, come up with a, an estimate of the cost of production. So looking at timber, um, finally, the uh, kind of two drivers on this is that we've got, we've got uh, strong um, <clears throat> inventory um, and a delayed harvest. And so if we look at some of the numbers here for uh, plain grade timber in the, su in the southern U.S., we're going to see that that number has been climbing, uh, at least with the last quarter of last year. Um, and so <clears throat> uh, demand for that, um, including timber used in lumber and pallet production, uh, declined. Um, in the third quarter, and then um, in terms of year over year, uh, went down about a half a percent. Uh, the largest decline in demand was reported in Georgia and North Carolina. Um, <clears throat> when we look over on the pine pulpwood um, and uh, chip demand in the southern U.S., uh, consumption across the south continues to be driven uh, by steady demand for, from the pulp and paper mills, um, in addition to rising demand from pellet producers. Uh, demand for pulp used in newsprint and writing papers has declined substantially, um, as we would expect. Uh, fortunately, the decline in this market segment is being offset by increasing production of paperboard and paper products, uh, specifically fluff pulp. Um, as, as worldwide population and economies continue to grow, demand for pulp uh, consumer products um, paper towels, napkins, and things like that, um, we're, we're going to see those, uh, uh, you know, especially strong. Um, OSB, or oriented strand board, uh, is another use of pulp wood, uh, and demand for that is expected to rise um, as our, you know, as discussed previously, housing starts and things like this uh, move in a positive direction. Um, and so with that, uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, quit talking and, and allow our keynote speaker to come up uh, where I, I think Ken's going to introduce our keynote speaker. So thank you for your time. All right. I would like to have a uh, Matt. Where is he? is he? Oh, he's back there hiding. Okay. We could get Matt to come up. He's got some really, really interesting numbers for y'all today, I think. Uh, he spoke yesterday, and a lot of people stayed afterwards, and and we're discussing some of the, the implications that may come out of the uh, data here that, that Matt's going to talk to us about. He's with the uh, Carl Vinson Institute, and I think you're the state demographer, right? Is that correct? I mean, not officially. Not officially, but unofficially he is, okay. I'm the only one. So, yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess by virtue of being the only one, it makes me it, right? <laughs> the only fish in the pond, if you will. So uh, my name is Matt Howard. I'm applied demographer here at UGA. Uh, and I really specialize in, in population projections and Georgia's population. Uh, I do the official long range population projections that the governor's office uses in their strategic planning. So I'm gonna talk about sort of how the population in the state of Georgia has been changing over the last 30 years and where the state is moving to. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about three sort of overarching uh, trends within the state. I'm going to talk about overall population growth, so sort of how the recession has altered the growth pattern in the state. I'm going to talk about diversification within Georgia and how the state is diversifying. And lastly, I'm going to talk about aging, which kind of undergirds everything. So whenever I, I talk about a population, I always like to look at the long view, because I think it really helps situate where we're at today with where we're going. Now, if you look at Georgia's population change in the 20th century, it's pretty remarkable that in 1900, Georgia was about 2 million residents. It was a rural southern state. And by 2010, it's 10 million people, 10 million residents. And it's a major urban southern state. It's uh, an international player in a number of areas. We're the eighth largest state in the, in the country now. But if you really look at this graph, Almost all of that growth happened after 1960. Between 1900 and 1960, the state saw very little population change, very little growth at all. Now, if you think about any state, anywhere, there's only three possible ways, any population really, there's only three ways it can ever change. This is an ironclad law in demography. You can only add people to a population because they've been born, you can only take people away from a population because they die, and in between birth and death, we have migration. People move around. So we take those three, we can further reduce them to just two, what we call natural increase in net migration, where natural increase is the births minus the deaths. 
and net migration is the in migrants minus the out migrants. Now, as you can see, up until about 1960 or so, Georgia had negative net migration. So more people were leaving the state of Georgia than moving in. We could think about the state as being a net exporter of people. This is what we call the great migration, as people left the rural south into the industrialized north and into California. Now, this changes in the 1960s where we start to see increasing amounts of in-migration. This coincides, of course, with the civil rights movement and also the widespread adoption of air conditioning, making the South a much more livable place. This tops out in the 1990s where over a million more people moved into Georgia than left it, over a million. Now, if you look at all those red bars sitting on top of the blue ones, what this translates into is that for the adult population in the state of Georgia, so those over the age of 18, 51%, so the majority, were born in another state. They are not native Georgians. They're born in another state or another country, 51%. Now that red bar in the 2000s would have likely been higher than the 1990s, but in 2008, 2007, 8, 9, the economy decided to reorder itself, and in the process, people quit moving around. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change those red bars from being a numerical amount to a ratio, essentially. So it's gonna go from zero to 100. And this is what it looks like since the 1970s. Now, if you look at the 1990s as an example, 70%, so seven out of every 10 residents that the state added was because they moved here, as opposed to being born here. Now, if you also look, you'll notice that 2010 to 2011 has a very, small ratio of the growth due to migration. In fact, it's smaller than the 1970s. So we have to go back 40 and 50 years before we find a decade where the migration into the state of Georgia is at the level that we're currently at. Meaning that the 2010s are not like the 2000s or the 1990s or the 1980s or even the 1970s. They're more like the 60s or before. Now the good thing is that this, this bar chart, the 2010 to 2011, is creeping up. Now, if, we, if you pay attention to that last one, I'm going to change it from 2010 to 2011 to 2010 to 2012. So pay very close attention, and it just barely inches up. This is recovery migration into Georgia after the recession. This is now it's starting to pick back up. Uh, after the Great Recession. So if you keep watching that last bar, we'll go to 2013, it takes a step back, but then in 14 and in 15, it starts to increase again. It doesn't change the fact that we're still at historically low levels of in-migration into the state. And that historically low levels of migration is changing the way that the state is growing, dramatically changing it. If we look at how the state changed in the 2000s, so between census 2000 and 2010, in this map, the darker the color is more rapid growth and the gray or the white are counties that lost population. You can see Metro Atlanta, North Georgia, coastal Georgia, Southeast Georgia growing very rapidly. Parts of Southwest Georgia and parts of East Georgia were struggling to retain their populations. This is with that very high migration rate in the 2000s. If we looked at the 1990s, there's even fewer gray counties. But in the 2010s, with that very low in migration rate, this is how the state is now growing. Again, the darker is more rapid and the gray or the white are declines. Instead of isolated declines in Southwest and in East Georgia, we essentially have statewide pattern of population declines in a lot of rural areas. And we're seeing new, new patterns emerge that we really haven't seen in at least 70 and 80 years. There's 36 counties that now have negative natural increase. So in those communities, there are more deaths than there are births. There's 78 counties that have lost population since 2010. So half of the counties in the state of Georgia are seeing some form of population decline. Now, oddly enough, this is actually relatively good news in 2018 than it was in 2013, because in 2013, we were looking at around 84 counties that had lost population between 2010 and 2013. 
So again, migration is starting to pick back up a little bit. And so some of these counties that we're losing are now starting to gain again. This will not approach what we were like in the 2000s. In the 2000s, there were under 30 counties that saw population declines. We're going to be triple that number in the 2010s. Almost 100 counties have negative net migration, so they have more people moving out than moving in. And if you think about those communities that have negative natural increase and negative net migration, without a fundamental change, there's virtually no way for those communities to see some kind of growth. And just seven counties in total, seven, account for two thirds of the entire population growth in the state of Georgia. Six are in Metro Atlanta, and the seventh is Chatham County, which is in coastal Georgia. Now, four counties account for 50% of the state's overall growth. Those are Fulton, uh, Fulton Cobb, Forsyth, and Gwinnett counties. So we're seeing this massive concentration of growth in Georgia in the major metropolitan areas, almost at the expense of the rural areas. Now, this pattern is really not unique to Georgia. This is pretty much happening all over the US. This is a map from the Census Bureau, which is why the color scheme is absolutely terrible. But this is a very easy map to grab. What I really want you to pay attention to are the purple and the red counties. The purple counties are those that lost in the, um, after the recession and before the recession, and the red counties are those that lost before, are the ones that have lost after the recession. Yes, I got that right. Now, if you notice, there's pretty much red and purple counties in every single state. Texas, what they love to call the Texas miracle, it's got red and purple counties. California has got red and purple counties. Florida has red counties. Even North Dakota with the shale boom has purple and red counties. So this is basically happening all over the United States. And this pattern of rural population decline is new, relatively new, in Georgia. Did this happen in the 2000s? Did this happen in the 1990s? Well, if we look at 2010 to 2015, and we look at urban and rural Georgia, urban Georgia added over half a million residents in the last five years, whereas rural Georgia has seen a small decline in its population. And for some of these areas, there are very long-term trends toward population declines. There's 37 counties in the state of Georgia that had larger populations in census 1920 than they did in 2010. These are areas that basically never recovered from the depression. And there's 11 counties that had larger populations counted in 1860 than they did in 2010. That's basically never recovering from the Civil War. And this is even accounting for boundary changes within these communities. Now, if we look at these numbers, and again, did this happen in the 1990s and the 2000s? The answer is no. If you look, rural Georgia in, 19, in the 1990s added over 300,000 or almost 300,000 residents, almost as much as urban Georgia has grown already. If you look in the 2000s, rural Georgia still added over 100,000 residents. But in the 2010s, we start to see this decline. So again, we have to go back, back several decades before we find a comparable period of growth within the state of Georgia. Now, this is generally focused on growth and decline in versus out. But if you think about it, that's not the only way change can happen. I want you to think about a community where one person moves in and one person moves out. Net change in population, zero. However, the person who moved out had an annual income of $60,000 a year, and the person who moved in had an income of 40. That community is essentially $20,000 poorer. So if we take all those and we add them all up and we look at the net change in household income in rural Georgia, just due to migration, this is the distribution that we get. That vert, the uh, dotted line is zero. So as you can see already, most of the counties, rural counties in Georgia are on the right side or on the negative side of the distribution, but some are gaining quite a bit. We got Green County on one end, which is ranked 212th out of 3,000 counties, where in 2013, it added almost 15, $22 million in household income in a single year. That's a lot of wealth building. 
And on the other end, we have Bullock County, right towards the bottom of U.S. counties. Bullock lost about $12 million in household income. Now, when you add up all of these and you aggregate them and you go, okay, well, what's the net change in rural Georgia? It's $71 million in lost income every year. That is a significant headwind for these communities. And if you go, well, where are these people moving to? It's really not surprising. I think we all know the answer to that, and it's generally Metro Atlanta. So if we look, 71% moved to another urban area in Georgia who left a rural area, 23% moved out of state, and only 7% moved rural to rural in Georgia. So most of this migration is rural to urban. And when you look at the top five destinations, it's Fulton, DeKalb, it's, it's Metro Atlanta. It's almost 40% of those migrants are, in met are moving to Metro Atlanta. So we're seeing, again, this concentration of growth in our urban areas and largely coming from rural areas and also from other states. Migration is at a historic low right now, but it is recovering. And the, the consequence of that low migration is a complete change in the way that the state is growing. Now, if we talk about diversity, the state is also diversifying, and it's diversifying fairly rapidly. In 1980, 98% of all Georgians were either black or white. Our Hispanic population was 1% of the state's total, and all other race groups combined made up less than 1% of the state's total. But between census 1980 and 2010, the state underwent a very dramatic transformation. Instead of 98% of Georgians being black or white, it's 86%. Our black population that was a quarter is approaching a third. Our Hispanic population is almost 10% of the state's total. And this catch-all, this nebulous other, we can actually talk about those groups individually. In Georgia, it's largely Asian and multiracial that make up that category. And this trend, this is sort of baked into the demographic cake. It's in the batter. It's going to continue going forward into the future. And that the state is very likely to go minority majority sometime within the next 15 to 20 years. And for some areas in the state, they already are minority majority. And for some age groups in the state, they also are already minority majority. If you're a kindergartner in Georgia, you already live in a minority majority Georgia. Now, this doesn't mean that all race groups aren't growing. They are. It's just that we're seeing a larger amount of growth and our black, our Hispanic, our Asian, and multiracial populations. So if we look at this numerically between census 2000 and 2010, we can see that our black population grew the most rapidly, followed by Hispanic, and then white, and then the nebulous other, the catch-all. But if we look at this in terms of percentage growth, it paints a very, very different picture. And you can think about this in terms of an annualized growth rate, and we sort of have the stock market on one end and the bond market on the other, although maybe not the stock market right now. And we can think about this in one other way, which would be doubling time, or how long it takes a population to double at these growth rates. This is what's happening. This is the, tr this is the diversification that's happening within the state. Now, this is the 2000s, where migration rates were very high compared to what they are now. So all that's happened in the 2010s is that all of these numbers have just gotten smaller. Or in the case of the doubling times, they've all gotten larger. So here's 2010 to 2015. Again, all those growth rates have just come way down. But we still see the same differences between our white, black, Hispanic population, or our, our black, Hispanic other population and our white population. In every single community in the state of Georgia, every single county, is moving in this, in this direction, every single one of them. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is our aging population. Uh, this is definitely a challenge, especially in rural Georgia. Now, if you look at, if we were to look at just age groups in the state of Georgia, the most rapidly growing age group of the last 20 years has been our 45 to 64-year-olds. Now, there's, there's two major marketing terms to describe age groups. Uh, one is empty nesters, which would be this population, and the other one would be dinks. If you're unfamiliar with that term, it's a dual income, no kids. Now, what we want is this population, 45 to 64-year-olds, to be growing very rapidly. 
This is really good. Your earnings potential peaks in this age group. The amount of money you spend in the economy peaks in this age group. It's really, really great. So for the fact that our 45 to 64 year olds has been growing, it's doubled essentially in 20 years, is really, really good. The problem is that in the next 20 years, it won't be a doubling in our 45 to 64 year old population. And we can see that if we do like a very quick mock population projection. So this is Georgia's population in millions in 1990. So a 25-year-old, 20 years later, is a 45-year-old. Kind of ironclad. So we move them diagonally. This is how we get that 111 percentage change on our 45 to 64-year-old population, going from 1.2 to 2.4. But that 45-year-old now in 20 years is a 65-year-old. So again, we'll move them diagonally. Now, 45 to 64 year old is going to grow very little. And instead, we're going to see quite a bit of growth in our 65 and older population. And numerically, that growth is going to be even larger. Instead of 1.2 to 2.4, it's 0.9 to 2.4. If we look at the age structure of Georgia, you can really see the effect of this. This is the baby boom. This is the age structure in Georgia. Instead of a population pyramid, it's just turned on its side. We've got youngest on the left, oldest on the right, and I've bracketed off the boomers. And you can see it's like a mountain. And if we take this and we go forward to 2000, you can still see it. Again to 2010, and again, it's still kind of there. But what's happened is the tail end, the youngest ages have come up, and it's flattened. Instead of being a mountain, it's more like a plateau. And if we go forward again in a projection to 2010, this is essentially what we have. Now, the way to read this is within any age group, if that line is going up, it represents growth in that age group. So look at that first dotted line. It, it's uh, 55 to 59 year olds. In 1990, you're looking at 300,000 people. By 2020, you're looking at 700,000, right? You see how it goes up vertical. So we have a lot of growth in our, the right side, the old ages, and we have a lot of growth on the left side, the young ages. But right in the middle, there's very little growth. And you can see that. You don't even need a projection to see that because if you look at those red and that dark blue line, there's a point where they intersect and they, they just lie right on top of one another. That's our 30-something population. In Georgia, we had virtually the same number of 30-somethings in 2010 as we did in 2000. There was virtually no growth in that population. Now what the Census Bureau is projecting is that by within the next 50 years, the population over the age of 65 is expected to more than double. So I want you to keep that number in your head, 100% larger, twice as many retirees over the next 50 years. Because if we look at our working age adult population, those between 18 and 64, that growth is not going to be 100%. That is going to be 4%. So 4% more workers, 100% more retirees. But we will see growth, it's just specifically in our non-white populations, in our black, Hispanic, Asian, multiracial populations. In rural Georgia, this is particularly pronounced. This is rural Georgia's age structure. It looks like somebody took a bite right out of the middle of it. It took a bite right out of the 20-somethings in rural Georgia. It's because they moved to Metro Atlanta. Now, I'm going to forward this in time. We're going to go forward, and it's going to look like spaghetti, and that's on purpose. So here's 2000, here's 2010, 2020, and 2030. See all those lines are lying right on top of each other? There's no vertical growth in those lines in any given age group except for in the oldest age groups. And so if we were to summarize this for rural Georgia, if we look at our zero to 19 population, it's projected to decline by 1% over the next 15 to 20 years. If we look at our working age population, 20 to 64, it's gonna decline by 1%. But if we look at our 65 and older population, it's going to increase by 60%. Now remember, nationally, it's 100% in the next 50 years, and in rural Georgia, it's 60% in the next 15 years. So much shorter, much more rapidly. And we already see this today. If we look at the 10 oldest counties in Georgia, nine out of the 10 are all in rural Georgia. 
And the 10th county is considered urban is McIntosh County. And if you've been to McIntosh County, I don't know if you would necessarily say it's an urban center, but it has to do with the way the USDA makes their classifications. And for some of these areas, they're already considerably older than the statewide average. And a, the ironclad rule in demography, the law, is that in one year, all of us will be one year older. So for some of these communities where the median age is already 50, what's it going to be in 10 years? What's it going to be in five? If we did the flip and we looked at the 10 youngest counties in Georgia, nine out of those 10 are urban areas. And the one rural area is Bullock County, which is where Statesboro is, which would make sense as to why it's young. It's got a university there. So those are the three big sort of trends that are happening in Georgia's populations, especially in rural areas. We have a total change in the way that the state's growing. We have to go back a number of decades to find something that's very comparable. We have diversification that's happening within the state. It's sort of baked into the demographic structure. And we also have considerable amount of aging in our rural areas as well. Uh, at Vincent, we're social media savvy. So you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And if you wanted to contact me to ask any kind of questions at all, feel free to do so. This is my contact info. I get out into the state pretty frequently, so it's almost always better to, to send an email as opposed to call. And I think if we have some time, I might be able to answer a small handful of questions. But bear in mind, the only thing standing between lunch is going to be these questions. <laughs> yes, sir. Mm I have not looked into the effect of a terroristic event on population change. I can't really say either one way or another. Um, I, I, I haven't done any kind of work on that or even episodic. So something that might be like a major hurricane or something even similar. Um, I haven't done any work on that, so I, I really can't comment on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely possible. Um, but some of these are really long-term patterns. I mean, urbanization in America has been happening since the 1870s. So in some cases, it's, and it's, it's international. I mean, this is happening all over the world as well. So we're looking at, you know, several hundred years worth of, or at least, you know, over a hundred years worth of population trends in America moving in this manner. At the same time, fertility rates are at very low levels. Um, so fertility fell 15% since 2008. It turns out that, you know, having have starting a family in the middle of a recession is probably not a good idea. <laughs> and it turns out people didn't do it nearly as, as much. So there's all these different patterns that are all happening at one time. Um, I mean, I think that there's a lot of policy that can go into play that could really help rural areas, especially bringing people into these areas. And there's a lot of thought that's going on both at the state level and nationally to work through some of those policies. So. Yes, last question. Uh huh. Yeah, so the question was about essentially housing prices. 
Um, so that's one of the main reasons why people didn't move in 2008 and 2009, why the, the 2000s turned, to have, turned out to have fewer in migrants into Georgia than we did in the 1990s, because by all accounts, it should have been higher. It's just that in 08 and 09, people couldn't move. They couldn't get out from underneath their mortgage, basically. And so it put a real, I mean, a, a hard stop on migration. Florida, which has had positive net migration since 1960, in, in 2009, the net migration into Florida was zero. I mean, it zeroed out in a single year. Now, it bounced back, but it didn't bounce back to the same level as it was prior. So in terms of interstate migration, yeah, housing prices have played a pretty, play a pretty significant role. It, but that kind of goes into cost of living and living in the South. And, and really the Sun Belt. So it's not just, you know, you know it's not just Georgia. It's also Arizona as well and Texas. Um, in terms of locally, yeah, housing prices play a really big role in where people are locating within a given area. And it's one of the reasons why you see continued suburbanization that's, that's happening as well, since housing prices on the urban fringe tend to be lower than they are in the core. And, and you kind of see that, you know, you just have to look at Fulton and DeKalb versus you know, uh, Rockdale, Bartow, Cherokee, and so on. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. I uh, appreciate that. And we've got a number of folks online that are, that are watching this. Uh, this is the first location we've done this year online. And I know one of them is a local elementary school, Colin Ferry, Colin Ferry Elementary School is online, so their kids are learning about agriculture uh, today as well, too. With that, I think we're about ready to have lunch. I was wondering if we could get uh, <laughs> Brent Marable to come up and do our invocation for us.